Thank you, Jason. And welcome, everyone. It's good to be with you this afternoon, well, this morning, afternoon, or evening, however this, this may find you. Uh, personal reflections. Those of you who know a little bit of my background know that I was a, a hermeneuticist in formal training and that any consideration of personal reflections to be truly valuable and meaningful requires a little bit of context, uh, interpretive context. That's what, that's what hermeneutics do. So want to, before I dive into more of the directly connected reflections on solar winds, establish that context again for, for all of us here. Some of you who may have heard me in, in past uh, sessions over the last few years, uh, some of these uh, contextual points may ring familiar, but will uh, be something I think I can establish rather quickly and will add richness to the observations that I'll, I'll share later on. Uh, when I say that I'm a hermeneuticist, that's where I was headed formally in, in, in uh, training at university. The FBI pulled me into their world because they thought they needed them. If you're not familiar with the word hermeneuticist, it's uh, interpretation theory. It looks at and examines the variables around which is humans, human beings construct and, and interpret meaning in our, our world. Um, so uh, it was in that context that I, I, I found myself merged into the world of law enforcement, federal law enforcement, then the intelligence community, and in that role was amazed at the extent to which, even though we very much wanted to be proactively preventative, we found ourselves very much stymied in a dominant paradigm of the time called reactive detection. I wanted to get out there ahead of the terrorists before they struck Oklahoma City or the Unabomber or, or, or the... Uh, uh, Lockerbie bombing, but notwithstanding that desire, quite often found ourselves re reacting after the fact, and, and and found that to be the case in the cyber world as well. Very much we were reacting after even the, the newly emerging uh, freakers and hackers were presenting themselves. We were in a reactive mode, and I just sort of began to accept that as an inescapable aspect of the career or profession I chose. Uh, it gave way to all sorts of other aha experiences after I left government and joined the private sector of, of coming up against what we hear always touted is the not if but when syndrome. It's not if we're going to get compromised, it's when. Uh, and the just accepting that and the and the sometimes the cynicism that can sometimes even uh, present itself in association with that is is something we we uh, we kind of accepted. Uh, I've also then shared it as part of that context that it, that paradigm, while it became part and parcel of everything I did, and actually gave way to some very interesting constructs in our our world, the defense in depth structure that we so often hear about, where because we we failed up high in our kill chain, where our signature based antiviruses were failing us, we then had to put in place downstream measures that would hopefully make up for that. Uh, that defense in depth, or what I'd always called expense in depth because as a CSO or CISO, I was amazed at the, the amount of, well, not only complexity, but the resource intensiveness, but also the cost associated with that structure. It became a very expensive proposition that we, uh, we incurred. So it was in that context then and that I also eventually became aware of the fact that, you know, uh, I think it was Verizon's report at the time that 90% of all data losses were being tracked back to a malware experience of some sort or another. And that if we could just get our arms or start to do better battle with the malware that was morphing at amazing rates. I, the last figure I saw was 100 million instances in a single year, that just the rate and pace at which the malware was presenting itself was morphing and our inability as humans to keep up with it. It just, uh, it, 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 it was not a... Uh, an aspect of our lives that in, in, induced many to feel pleased or, or great that, hey, I've got another 20 years in, in, in whacking a mole, such as it was. But that was the world that we, we lived in. And it was at that point where that paradigm so deeply entrenched and, and it become such a familiar fixture in my life that I came up against a possibility that that entrenched paradigm was going to be upended, upseated, uh, like Thomas Kuhn wrote in his book, The, 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 the Structure of Scientific Re Revolutions. And that was when I got exposed and presented to AI and machine learning and the power and strength that it was bringing uh, to our world. Um, and as many of you know, the last uh, four years or so, or five years almost now, I've been roaming the uh, basically the world at large as, as Silence's ambassador at large, which was the... the uh, the creator of that first instance of AI supported machine learning that I encountered and basically upended my world with understanding that, you know, these paradigms aren't as entrenched and inflexible and immutable, inescapable as we may have thought they were. This, the, the fact that uh, uh, AI supported 
uh, math model supported antivirus could actually stop to the tune of 99.9. It was incredibly off the charts in terms of the, the success and the rate at which it could, it could penetrate and, and uh, stop these incoming uh, viruses that uh, it, 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 it distilled upon me that indeed a, a new age was, was dis descending and, and was what actually moved or motivated me to leave Michael. To, I said, I'm not leaving you, Michael, I'm moving up your kill chain, but to slide over into this new and emerging world. So now that's in that way of important context, because then, as I've said, I, I traversed the globe then for four years as Silence's ambassador at large, and uh, would share with audiences like this one and customers the prowess of AI-powered uh, machine learning uh, was bringing to the battle space. I was frequently asked, though, if we, uh, what we could anticipate in the way of a reaction from our adversaries. In the shadow of solar winds compromise, my thoughts again reverted to those questions, thus this, the title of this, this brief uh, webinar. My response at the time when I was being asked by people is, what could we anticipate in the way of a retaliation, a pivot, or an adjustment, uh, was that would, there definitely would be one. There's just too much at stake financially and otherwise for there not to be a response on the part of our adversaries. It's like Willie Sutton, the old bank robber, when they asked him coming out of, uh, out of the courthouse, Willie, Willie, why do you rob banks? Well, it's where the value is. It's where the, the money is. So in like fashion, my reasoning was that we, we had to anticipate. At the time, my initial impression was that uh, based on what I'd seen nation state adversaries do before in response to a, a perceived advancement that I made in my cyber defenses, was to watch them retreat into the physical world and to advance their interests uh, through those vectors, through the physical world. They looked to and exploited trusted insiders. In one instance, they reached out to and tasked a member of my own security team, charging them to tell no one, particularly their US master, and to advance their tasks exclusively in the physical world, where indications of compromise were less likely to be detected and with ever-growing sophistication uh, of AI-supported uh, uh, cyber tools. So let's stick to this, the physical world. That I learned about this tasking means that such much of the cynicism of today so often in, that impugns the, the wisdom of having extended hard-earned trust to certain humans, you know, was I think uh, uh, undermined because I, it was that team member that actually came to me and said, hey, here's how, I, here's how I've been tasked. Although a speculation as to, to how solar winds was indeed perpetrated continues to mature and we continue to gain insights along that line, I believe the exploitation of trusted insider must remain in the mix of possible explanatory theories. Other elements, of course, have persisted, long patient and patient reconnaissance, spear phishing, the exploitation of CI, CD, CD uh, architectures and efficiency plays, uh, the porosity and extended nature of our modern supply chains, no shortage of weak links uh, through uh, which an adversary can, can possibly assert themselves. Uh, and finally, crimeware as a service and the attribution challenge made even more difficult with ever increasing conduits of plausible deniability. Now, not unlike the compromise I experienced in which an adversary was discovered to have, have made successful entry nearly two years earlier and then exhibit the prowess and the patience to shut down and wait for what they deemed was the optimum moment to strike in advance of sensitive negotiations, solar winds, the solar winds affair was most likely, I believe, preceded by months, if not years, of conscientious re reconnoitering. Attackers most likely surveyed the software supply chain of companies years in advance. URL endpoints by which they might deliver malware were set up concomitantly. Once solar winds was targeted, that patience was punctuated by waiting until their market penetration grew to a huge footprint in the network monitoring domain and amongst government customers. While exploitation of trusted insider might well have been leveraged, several other possible attack vectors could have been advanced con con concurrently. The recent spate of well-crafted targeted spear, spear phishing instances could have served as one of those other vectors. The sophistication of such, such efforts has been has, has demonstrated a marked uptick in recent years. You remember the FBI, especially in the in the wake of the the, the coronavirus and, and its onslaught, the the reports coming in from the FBI, just how the number of spear phishing exploits has just exponentially gone through the ceiling. From there, a successful credential compromise 
not having uh, would not uh, have been long in following, and it's associated internal entry and lateral movement with all that that entails. Evolving in an equally precarious manner, adding to the complexity evidenced in this compromise has been the growth and acceptance over the years of the backbone of modern day dev DevOps operations, continuous introduction, continuous delivery, an approach to software development that seeks to leverage soft uh, seeks to leverage shorter development cycles in delivering a steady stream of potentially disruptive innovations to customers, and customers haven't changed much over the decades, customers who incess incessantly clamor for more faster. We now grasp the implications of a foundational systems whose updates were compromised and propagated in that manner. The contextual battle space in which that propagation occurred has, was further exacerbated by the growing porosity that makes up the modern supply chain. Think the Boeing 787, if you remember the number of suppliers that made up that, that, uh, that platform, giving an adversary almost an unlimited number of weakest links through which to explore the options and realize the fruits of their efforts. And this of course has just been exacerbated in a world where we hear the internet of everything, as I call it, continues to grow at just incredible rates. I think the last figure I saw was 67, 68 billion devices, connected devices by 2025. A target rich environment indeed. And finally, uh, the emergence and sophistication and plausibility, plausible deniability associated with crimeware as a service, now available in the dark web and documented in such recent reports as our BlackBerry report on the, the Bahamut report, means that nation states can mask their efforts now behind third party contractors and an almost impenetrable wall of plausible deniability. Such actors can obfuscate their efforts in a manner that makes it appear as though they originated practically anywhere making any quick declarations of attribution, which never seemed to be lacking, right? In impugning the usual suspects, understand understandably suspect. At the end of the day, companies as users of software have witnessed another reason for applying zero trust networking principles and role-based access controls, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, in the next coming slides. We've often heard and continue to hear, uh, again, as I mentioned about these, these conscientious reconnoitering of the supply chain in this ever-growing connected world. Uh, even was, uh, and the waiting I already mentioned, but uh, the, the other interesting aspects I thought of this is as, as people started to scrutinize, congressional hearings were heard, the uh, protestations on the part of uh, some that it was you know the, the intern, playing the intern, when in fact it, uh, the indications are uh, reflective of some internal practices that all of us as CISOs know we, we, we need to improve and have been out there for some time, but for whatever reason, maybe it was a short budget or whatever, uh, took some time in, in getting our attention uh, applied to them. So that was an interesting aspect of, of the, uh, the whole affair. Uh, what, what really I think sounds interesting to me, and, and this is because again, uh, remember I was quite pleased and surprised to see that a dominant paradigm of reactive detection had been turned on its head. But in the wake of solar winds, and I believe again, solar winds is that, that reflection, I believe if we look at it, of, of, and an answer to that question that people were asking me, how is it that we're gonna see the bad guys pivot? Well, I think as we look at the elements of, 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 of the solar winds compromise, that answers our question. They're gonna look for ways by which they can try and avoid those choke points at which we've applied the strength of our AI math models and look for ways to, to get around that. In part one, like I said, le leveraging the human to try and get in and, and, and access uh, that information. But uh, in other ways uh, that they're, they're gonna try and attempt to, to do this, I think is now going to be addressed by the fact that uh, AI and machine learning supporting a, a, the, the upending of yet another paradigm that's been with us for almost as long as reactive detection. And that's the paradigm of, of perimeter security. Let's make a, a hard, a crunchy outside while allowing a soft gooey inside. That's been with us for, I guess, just almost as many years. And the fact that now, on the back and the strength of, of AI supported math models that we can actually embrace and move to the point of not what I would really like to call zero trust, although I, I'm using that phrase because I think most of you are familiar with that term, but I actually like to use uh, another phrase, continuous trust, because I think AI properly leveraged 
uh, in that network uh, can afford us the, the ability to not jettison trust that we as humans value so much, but actually embrace it fully and completely and continuously and not have to jettison it as, as, an, as an individual moves about their daily activities from any place that might be, whether that's in the classic workplace or at home, as we're continuing to work remotely in the co uh, coronavirus, but b being able to do that in a, in a trusted manner uh, and in a way that um, our role-based access controls supported by uh, AI and math models, and in, in Black Bear, we call that solution persona, where at any instant, if indeed uh, someone got into the, the network in our interests and started to go after the identity of an individual, that the, uh, the behavior-based uh, attributes that, that characterize each of us so uniquely as individuals would uh, almost instantaneously be uh, signaled as, as a deviation from what the AI uh, solution knows to be the, the classic uh, uh, presentation or, or, uh, uh, or not signature, but uh, identity of that individual. So uh, again, we're seeing then that that, that turns the, or twists the battle space on the adversaries almost as dramatically as, as the, uh, the, the forces we introduced into the battle space when we started uh, defeating antiviruses with uh, what uh, SC Labs called that two-year predictive advantage, where uh, the strength of those math models said that had WannaCry or NetPedia presented itself two years ago, the strength of the model at that time was still sufficient to defeat it. So with this kind of strength and, and ability now extending itself beyond the AV realm, but even into the identity and access management realm, uh, we're going to see another twist or, or, or impact to the, the adversaries uh, that will cause them to, I, I believe, will pull up short and saying, well, now we thought we had something figured out that we could advance in, in uh, the wake of solar winds, but now even the AI adversaries are twisting or applying it in a way that is going to make them uh, you know, it's like the tennis match, hitting the ball back into their court, that they're going to have to go back and rethink once they come to, to deal or grapple with the strength of a persona or these uh, continuous authentication solutions based on that AI. And then when you take all those solutions, well, and, and that AI supported uh, capability and import it into your your EDR, your, your, your uh, endpoint detection and response, because again, there, there's, there's no shortage of ways in which the clever adversary might yet still think of, of circumventing and getting in. Having a robust EDR capability that in like fashion is also predicated upon that AI math model uh, strength is, is yet going to turn and, and, and twist the battle space yet further for the adversaries. You take that strength and prowess combined then and overlay on it a unified um, endpoint management system and a unified security management system so that the complexity that classic defense and depth structures presented for us where we're having to look at so many different panels to get a sense or an awareness of the battle space, reducing that down through a unified endpoint security system that pulls all these different instances of our AI supported solutions into a, a very manageable, easy to view and engage uh, uh, panel. Uh, again, it adds an element to the the battle space that we haven't enjoyed here to four, and is again an another one of those unexpected advantages of of this new age. Finally, uh, um, I talked about these two paradigms that we've we've actually had the pleasure in our short careers to see upended: the signature-based antivirus and the network perimeter. There is actually a third paradigm that's been around and has plagued me just as long, and and that is the the siloed nature of uh, cyber and physical security solutions or operations. You know, some of you may have noticed just a few weeks ago that CISA in the United, in the United States came out with a a piece actually chronically and championing the realignment of of corporations along this what they call the converged model where physical and cybersecurity are brought together under one operational umbrella instead of being advanced as they've classically been advanced. And again, the underlying reason for this is it's been around for some time. I, I learned it early on when Dark Dante showed me when I was going up in battle against him how he could exploit a physical vulnerability in order, order to undermine a cyber interest or undermine a cyber vulnerability in, in order to undermine a physical interest. So we've known that it was that we as organizations were more or less likely to overlook these growing interdependencies if we converged our houses. So it's finally that even the US government through the auspices of the CISA is now championing and advocating this paradigm shift 
uh, so that we will be we will uh, to the extent that we embrace this and i've i've had the opportunity of embracing that new model at every one of the the companies i've 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 had the privilege of serving but as we embrace that we'll also have the the opportunity to see that these these three paradigm shifts are going to continue to to give it to the bad guys as as variables that they're going to have to continue to to consider and try and find workarounds, just like they they tried to with with solar winds. The other aspect that and, and not unassociated with that converge, but important for us in the industry because of the 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 lack of, of trained resources that gets uh, touted out there in the press. I think the last figure I had, I saw for a global shortage of of workforce uh, talented workforce was like four million globally. Much of that demand and the requirements that produce that kind of number is these very intensive, complex reactive detection defense and depth structures that uh, the lack of the AI supported solutions has, has given way to. Once we start seeing and re realizing the fruits of, of AI properly applied up high, the number of individuals that it will take to sustain a structure, we, we, we should see go down. Um, and I think, I believe I've already seen it come down, resulting in, in our movement towards what I called a cord organization. For years, I grappled with the three Cs, uh, uh, complex, uh, 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 costly and and chaotic, those three C's. I now say these are the three C's of our, our modern age, of this age we're going into, of converge, cord, down to the minimally essential uh, number required in order to build an advanced and AI-supported shop with the, the liberated resources now being free to be applied to the other subtleties of insider threat, because I think that's going to continue to be a challenge for us. As a bad guy say, well, just like they did as I saw them move towards the physical world uh, and tag or, or target or, or challenge one of my uh, my security individuals to come in against me, uh, we'll, we'll see that that continue to be a variable, I think. And then finally, this connected piece where so many of the, so much of the complexity that we've grappled with has been these isolated, disparate solutions handling one piece of the, the puzzle, finding that with an underlying data lake of AI supported math models, uh, advancing our protect uh, piece on the endpoint, our EDR, our identity access management, even our mobile our mobile piece, so we extend the prowess of AI into that mobile space, we find in that connected world then another piece of this new and emerging uh, paradigm. So I think that, Jason, Jason, with that, I will pass the, the baton back over to you because that is a, that's really the bulk of my prepared comments today. My Absolutely reflection, my, my, my personal reflections in the wake of solar winds tied into a 30 year career in the in the battle space. <laughs> fantastic stuff. Well, I'll just leave this up here just again so people can just take note of the name and uh, by all means reach out to John on LinkedIn and connect um, and keep the network growing. So we do have some questions coming in, loads of chatting going on as we can see in a bit and some, some communication between the attendees here. I'm picking out a couple of questions not necessarily directed to you here, um, but would love to get your opinion. The first one that was posed mm. to the group of attendees was, insider threat is very important. Has anyone incorporated zero trust into their insider threat program? Or a better question is, is insider threat in your wheelhouse? I'm keen to hear your thoughts on what you see other organizations doing there, John. Yeah, and, and you know, as, as has come along in a number of times in my career, zero trust was pulled like a stiletto in a street fight in a way and, and touted about as, as if it were an endpoint one achieves as opposed to sort of a, an orientation, a shift in thinking in terms of the mindset. So, uh, you know, I promised uh, when I was worked for Michael Dell that I would deploy internally whatever we sold the outside world. And I extended that same commitment to John Chan that here at BlackBerry, we would deploy whatever we were offering the outside world. And, and so the way I like to characterize it is that, you know, Zero trust isn't necessarily a set of products that you buy or you deploy or you actually engage. It can be supported and movement towards that orientation is facilitated, as I've said, by, by actual uh, pillars in a what we call our cyber suite. So the engagement of those particular solutions can pre-position you and, and, and enable you to invoke that continuous trust environment without which you, you, would, be, you would be left uh, clueless or in, incapable, even if you wanted to, to move in that direction. So I like to make that distinction as people discuss and reflect on you know, how real and, and, and actionable is this move, this philosophical move, because I believe it is there. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very confident that I'll be able in short order to demonstrate the actual measurable 
uh, efficiencies gained, liberations that occurred of, of people held prisoner to the, the defense in depth structure, and that we'll, we'll see us move in that direction. I, I hope that's responsive to the, the question, that it, it is a real a reality. I mean, a lot of my peers have said, John, you know, a lot of the guys your age have already headed to the barn, they're retiring, and here you are still in the game. And I said, you're right. And uh, what keeps me in the game is the excitement and the enthusiasm I have for the game-changing influence that these technologies can have. After playing catch up and always on the losing end of things for so many years, the idea or prospects of being on the winning end or the winning side for at least a while until they, you know, like they pivot. But then even if they pivot, I think we're controlling that battle space better than we used to in, in which we, uh, we, we, we can close off the options that they have in terms of just how much they can pivot and where they can pivot to. We're controlling that space a, a lot more. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, another question I just picked out on the chat before I move to the Q&A feature over here, though, is um, quite openly, what is BlackBerry doing to converge physical and cyber? Well, we're we each company who uh, that I've worked for on that journey has has gone down different paths, depending on what their current state or their present state is. Um, BlackBerry was already in the process of pivoting itself from the old BlackBerry. In fact, it's amazing to me still when I, I say, hey, I'm the new CISO of BlackBerry, and people go, BlackBerry? <laughs> you know, they love it. The, 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 the sentiments, is the, 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 uh, the, uh, the loyalty and the, the fond memories is still there. But that John Chan came in and basically uh, affected a pivot there that turned us from the uh, device manufacturer to this AI-based uh, cyber security, cyber security software company uh, it was an environment that, and it changed, especially as we bought uh, Silence, that we were affecting the the convergence and the and the move and the uh, the cultural shifts associated with those variables. So in my time as CISO, I've been focused more on on those subtleties and ensuring that I weave into the current operations the cybersecurity solutions that we're we're advancing, but. The other piece of that convergence of bringing the physical in is taking the prowess of our ad hoc solution, which is a, a crisis uh, response uh, solution that, that can be triggered by events in the physical world as well as events and, and activities in the cyber world. So our activities in that convergence right now is really one of the more dramatic instances of the way in which the prowess of that ad hoc solution can, can enable and bring the response capabilities of an organization, uh, whether that response is being triggered by a cyber event or a physical world event, bring it in a way that you've got that transparency and that visibility across the spectrum. And then uh, operation, we're still looking to, as, as we get these things matured and take, so it's on my agenda, of course, I'll, I'll pull the classic uh, 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 efforts together as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, question here from one of the attendees. Prior to the SolarWinds hack, we had been considering acquiring Orion to upgrade our monitoring stack internally. Obviously, now we have put that on hold. How do you perceive this as a go-forward strategy now? Is it they had their event and now they are better? Still at risk? Wait a little, then go, or permanently seek other options? Well, you know, here's the old saying, change is the only constant. Uh, I don't think any of us really have the option of, of sitting statically. You, you, you always have to respond to the variables that get thrown at you. Uh, to the best of your ability, uh, garnering and, and advancing as much of the intelligence out there as to the superior solutions that are there. I still lament and, and I'm just saddened sometimes by the, 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 the number of, of headlines that still promulgate their tell of, of ransomware uh, uh, victimizations. And especially if it's a, if a peer of mine that I've known for years, uh, it saddens me because, you know, it's the old saying of all the words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these, it need not have been. What were you thinking? What were you doing? What was the inertia that was holding you prisoner to a structure, a signature-based antivirus structure when you knew, as documented by the SE last week, that there was a solution out there that had a success or conviction rate of 99.9 .9 and it gets, you know, some, a lot of the tests I've been in and it's been 100%, but the attorneys don't like me to talk like that. But, you know, what was that inertia that held you prisoner in the face of that kind of data? And I've thought a lot about that. And sometimes it's, it's that when we gave birth to these defense and depth structures, there's almost a, a, the love of giving birth and that you, you, you have some loyalty or attachment emotionally to these archaic structures, uh, in part because what you did do is say, well, look, 
we still talk about mean time to detection. If I can at least tweak the mean time to detection down to something acceptable so that even if I get compromised, I'll detect it quickly and I can move to mitigate with my incident response, then no harm, no foul, I'll, I'll let the old archaic system carry forward. Uh, it's, it's, that's the closest to the kind of thinking I think might under, uh, underpin and explain this inertia. But I think at the end of the day, uh, given what we've seen in the way the adversaries are, are, are morphing and, and the way, in fact, they're actually using AI, that, uh, that that is something we need to, even though we may understand it, we need to move away from that and, and engage uh, now with the solutions that are out there. But again, I, in as much as I was uh, one of the biggest uh, unbelieving embracers of these AI solutions, I thought, oh, geez, this is a bunch of, I said BS. I, thought, I just don't believe these numbers. I, I think it's got to be wrong. And I, I went out and had my team test test them against the latest that the Chinese had thrown at me. And when they came back and said, hey, if we'd had this deployed, we would not have been compromised. Then any thought or notion, again, of, of, of holding off or lingering in any way to the old paradigms just vanished for me. And I, I, I've never looked back, I pushed forward. I hope that was somewhat responsive to, the, to that pause, wait, or, or move forward. Uh, it's admittedly a little self-serving since I say in moving forward, then you would have to embrace something like we're offering. But uh, at, I think even dispassionately, I, and if I were looking at the peers, that, especially those friends that, that were compromised uh, after that point when it need not have happened, I would say you know, we need to move forward, especially if the, the solutions are, are uh, deployable in modules or in ways that can accommodate a gradual transition through from a, an archaic structure that took some time to create and put in place. I know you can't change over pivot overnight. It takes some time. And so looking for solutions that are quite compatible with the, the incumbency or the incumbent is a, another critical element of all this. Lovely, thank you very much. Very well answered indeed. Um, has the AI algorithm for BlackBerry Protect been evaluated independently by ICSA labs or similar to rate its effectiveness? Well, that was, uh, the, I made sort of reference to that when I mentioned SE Labs, which is an independent mm. lab and the, and the studies they did. And that's when they came up with what we now characterize as this predictive advantage where they, uh, this is very much like that old movie Minority Report, right? <laughs> where where the, the cog, precogs could predict in advance of a, a crime being committed that it was going to happen and, and that the math model strength was such that if we had gone back in time two years before WannaCry even appeared or, or NetPedia and, and, and ran them against the model, uh, they would have been convicted, they would have been stopped. That's, that was one of the most uh, uh, compelling and interesting uh, lab studies that I I came across as a as a CISO and uh, um, again it had this aha experience for me uh, not, not just because it tied into some popular fiction but it it uh, it uh, it just again was what it what's brought home in my mind that that the the battle space was pivoting and I was finally going to be in what I called a superior position to that which the adversaries had lorded over me for you know twenty years or more. Mm -hmm. I can understand uh, completely. Um, Dan, we kind of started the statement, obviously quite widely regarded, no organization is, a, is immune to cyber breach, right? It's a matter of when, not if. Um, but what's your approach on addressing concentration risks at hand? And by concentration hand, what, uh... what is your approach on addressing concentration risks at hand? Tanwir, if you're able to elaborate a little bit in the chat feature, that would be fantastic. And whilst John's collecting this thoughts, so we'll move on to another question. So Tanwir, if you could just uh, elaborate a little bit further on that question. Um, another question, what is your, what would your idea of continuous trust require continuous verification? Well, without that, that continuous verification or substantiation, you can't have continuous trust. So it's, a, it's the, uh, and again, the, the math model, when I first was in, in, introduced to it, I was curious is because uh, I was very much tied to an alphanumeric password that you'd have to enter in various times and have to constantly uh, change or alter, which, which causes a lot of friction and, and dissatisfaction with our classic customers. Uh, but as I, I embraced the model and it was and saw that it had a, I think it was at the time it was like a 10 day um, learning period. And that after that 
that learning period, the friction that you would experience from these classic instances of authentication were drastically and dramatically released. And that once it got to know you, almost like it, the, the AI knows a, a, a malicious or a, a healthy s signature or whatever, and can, can, and can, can uh, act upon that, it knows uh, on a continuous basis uh, after the math model has learned you, if I, I you know, because it's uh, math models also always have to be continuously trained and are continuously learning as it's been trained and it learns John McClurg as as John McClurg, uh, it is on a, a, a nonstop continuous basis uh, verifying that nothing that I'm doing deviates or signals a concern or a warning that uh, because of some practice of mine, I somehow have had my identity or my, my, uh, my account compromised and would at least then quarantine it to a point while additional questions could be asked to ver verify that this, this deviation or this anomaly uh, has an explanation that's acceptable and then can be added to that which the, uh, the math model then learns and, and weaves into its, its continuous you know, whether you call it continuous verification or continuous authentication, uh, they're one and the same. Hopefully that's responsive. Definitely, and there was a follow-up question, and excuse me if I missed you addressing that, but there was a follow-up question to this, is how does that impact operational efficiency? Well, um, operational efficiency, I mean, most of us are still so preoccupied with just hopefully being effective. And then as economic pressures come to bear on us, then we have to turn our attentions to efficiencies. But uh, uh, we're, we're overcome by the, the level of effectiveness that the, the new world brings and that it can do it with significantly less human resources because of our inability, uh, using AV as an example, to, to keep pace of that, the efficiencies there uh, start to come out uh, considerably. And if you look at the um, the infrastructures associated with, well, with with uh, corrupted machines, the rebuilds, and the the time, energy, and efforts that our CIO partners used to have to put in and in, in building and cleaning machines and getting uh, temporary machines out to users because of that. And you look at the 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 com commensurate infrastructure that's required and historically has been advanced in terms of password resets and other sorts of things like that. That there's a significant portion of the friction that historically made our our customers unhappy uh, being mitigated, but it also allowing us uh, should we should we be inclined and need to claim efficiencies and I I think uh, with revenue generations being down in the wake of, of coronavirus that a lot of corporations even if we figured out how it is we're going to allow our people to work from home in a safe and and protected manner there's still these new challenges is what's the cost associated with these these new ways of doing business and our CEOs uh, our, and our CFOs particularly are going to feel pressure points to to drive down the cost of operations. They're, you're seeing many of them now look at, uh, you know, can our folks, have our folks proven that they're capable of working remotely? And if so, can they do that on a continuing basis? And if that's the fact or case, what does that do in terms of the cost structures of our, our physical footprint that we used to have to maintain in order to advance our business? And what are those savings or those efficiencies mean then to the the, the shareholders and the boards, particularly in terms of, you know, our cost of revenue numbers and the uh, the the numbers we have to hit before we can start clear, declaring a, a a profit. So those variables are very much at play, and will make this uh, another element that will make this this time these times that we live in so interesting. Thank you very much. Um, with vendors like SolarWinds with a password of SolarWinds one two three, or recently <laughs> Vercada. Um, that embedded a system password in, pub, in public code that led to the breach. It's easy yeah. to pass judgment. However, yeah. where do you draw the line between vendors who are negligent versus made an honest mistake? Well, and again, the hermeneutics in me will come out here. It's uh, easy to, in retrospect, cast stones and aspersions and criticisms uh, at a at a, a partner or a team member or, or someone who at the time they were acting may have been uh, with the data they had in hand making the best decision than they could. Now, in some of these instances, retrospectively, we, we feel inclined to say, well, no, I don't think they were making the best decision they could at the moment. There, there was data available to them that knew that they could have been doing better. So it's not in every case that that would be uh, the, 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 the 
fact, but uh, my my basic beginning point, the hermeneutics in me is want to be uh, cautious or careful not to retrospectively uh, impugn or punish uh, our peers uh, with data that we now have that uh, is easy to, to, to throw or cast aspersions uh, back that way. Um, I, I, again, I, I think the, the well, the, the hermeneutics system, I say we always have to be challenging ourselves as we stand in our various positions. What are the unspoken assumptions that we're yet harboring in town in terms of what's capable, uh, what we, we should be doing now, the prioritization that we give the various activities before us. We know that, you know, risk is a function of threats, vulnerabilities and impact and the coefficients that precede any of those elements and that, um, uh, we can't protect everything and that uh, possibilities don't, probabilities don't actualities make and that in very austere or constrained financial times, and I've experienced this in my career on a number of occasions, I didn't have the luxury to going after the, the remote possibilities or even the probabilities in some cases. I had to sort of restrict my activities to what I could establish as an inevitability, a, an actuality that was poised to, to strike not just anywhere in my company, but at the revenue generating portions of the business. And that's that's the constraints under which I, I, I functioned. And those sort of constraints also, I think, make of all of us a little more generous or charitable in the, the criticisms we sometimes hand down on our peers. Though, like I said, I bemoan the fact that I see some of my peers still suffering from, from the consequences of inaction that, that were clearly signaled in, and, and, and out there and available for them. So I'm sorry, I weighed on a bit there. Uh, Jason, I hope I, I was somewhat responsive. No, no, you're fine. We've got, we got time for one more question here. Yeah. Um, and the question I'm going to ask is, Obviously, we've got organizations of various sizes in the audience, and we know security for smaller organizations um, is a really, really, really big challenge. Yeah. The question that comes in is with a more and more complex IT infrastructure to manage, for example, prem, cloud, the hybrid, et cetera, et cetera, how can you achieve a minimal core cyber protection approach? Yeah, um, and, and this is a strategy or an option that I think uh, I've even entertained as a, the CISO or the CSO of a large, you know, 140,000 employee organization in a 70 country space and that is uh, leveraging uh, or co-sourcing or, or leveraging managed security services that are now out there now I admit this is self-serving because that's one of the things Blackberry now does but even there as I I manage my own sock and I'm thinking if I were a small mom and pop shop I wouldn't I may not even have a sock but if I'm a little larger and I've at least attempted to establish a sock that maybe doesn't want 24 by 7 365 but is trying to to raise the flag and do the noble work at least as far as it can that in many instances I, I might get that just barely established and because of the demand for talent in that space I, I barely get it established and someone comes along and hires my talent away so there's that constant flux that again a mom and pop shop just aren't going to be able to to tolerate because those of us who have larger organizations find that somewhat daunting at times so again looking around and embracing the services now that are, are open to them. And, and, and uh, we've got an instance of uh, where we offer virtual CISOs where you, you know your threat profile now demands or should ask that you establish an indigenous CISO, but you're just not quite there in terms of your revenue generation, maybe perhaps, or your ability to, to sustain that. So you can engage these services that, you know, uh, fractional ownership, if you will, that can help you establish the, the, the foundational steps that will better position you when you are able to take on a CISO uh, more on a more full-time basis. And a lot of times I know they'll try and steal the, the virtual CISO that they've become comfortable with if, if possible as that moves along. So I think that model there again, and this, this speaks to the porosity between you know, the mom and pop shops and the larger, those mom and pop shops in a lot of part are, are part of our supply chain. And if we think then we're going to sit there and, and, and feel proud of ourselves because of the, the, the internal security we have wrapped around our interests, but we haven't appreciated and turned our attention to the need to secure in a connected world, in a porous world, these, these smaller entities, then we will have fooled ourselves. It, you, it, it's a game in, in which we now have to bring everybody along. And I think this model of, of uh, managed security services is an option that uh, is, is a viable uh, solution to these smaller organizations. Definitely. One final question before I wrap things up. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of optimism around the capabilities that AI machine learning brings when fighting against uh, cybercrime. However, how important is it to remember to blend human intelligence within your organization with artificial intelligence? 
Yeah, and Kai Fu Lee uh, in his book uh, Cyber Su or AI Superpowers addresses this this tension or this dynamic, finding the the sweet spot uh, between uh, the partnership between the AI and the math models and the what I call the carbon-based units. I I think the 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 marriage and the the, the relationship between our silicon and our carbon <laughs> is is a critical, and there will always be a role and relationship between that. Uh, but pragmatically, I mean. While we admit that, there's just uh, certain aspects of the way we've advanced things in the past, and the, well, just the pay, pace and rate at which those million new uh, uh, malware instances that are appearing every year, the rate and pace at which they morph and they change and they they adapt, just defies the cognitive capabilities of a human. And so we know in that instance that says, well, that that partnership or that that blending between the the silicon and the carbon. Uh, has to take those sort of variables into to place. And so I, I, I don't think it's a, the answer to that is, is gonna be articulated and fixed at any one moment. I think as we, we come to appreciate the, the capabilities and the demands of, the, of both sides of that thing, we'll shift and tweak and adjust uh, accordingly. And that'll be part of the, the fun and the excitement as we see this uh, unfold. I say excitement, I, I don't think we can afford to be cavalier. We need to be very diligent. Uh, I think of the insider threat program I built uh, and how I realized at the back end of it that I perhaps hadn't uh, anticipated just how strong it was and, and wove, wove in uh, greater protections for, let's say, uh, privacy to a greater extent because of the strength or the power of of AI and machine learning. So that partnership between the cognitive human and, and the interests and variables that we as humans carry with us, I think is gonna be an ongoing relationship and dynamic. And I would recommend Kai Fu Lee's book for those who would like to explore that, that topic even further. Fascinating read. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So once again, I'm gonna ask our attendees to join me and assume you will join me in giving Mr. John McClurg a virtual round of applause from wherever you may be. Thank you very much, John. That was absolutely fantastic. Jason, my great.